so now, in chapter 9, we meet the man that God has chosen to be the first king of Israel, Saul. The first thing we find out about King Saul is, man, does he look the part. He is not just handsome, he is incredibly handsome. He is not just tall, he is a head taller than every other man in Israel. He comes from a wealthy family. He comes from a small tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. And this is good because it means that the big tribes like Ephraim and Judah don't have to worry so much that he's favoring one over the other. So Saul on the outside is a perfect candidate. But who is this man on the inside? Well, in the first couple of chapters here, Saul's character is subdued. He's a bit hard to read. I don't want to try and read all the later events back into Saul's early life. And just look at those first few chapters. He comes off as a bit of an everyman. A hard-working, humble, dutiful, pious son who rises to become the national hero. So, for the sake of King Saul and everyone else in this story, I wish Saul's story had ended in chapter 12. <laughs> At the beginning here, we only see glimpses of the character flaws that are going to be his undoing. Saul is one of the major tragic figures of all of scripture. He starts out good. He's even well-intentioned. And he can be so much like us. It's scary. We first see Saul on a bumbling, ordinary day. The family's donkeys have run off again, and his father sends him and a servant to go find them and bring them back. After three days with no luck, they're ready to head home. But the servant says, Behold, there is a man of God in the next city. Let us ask him about the donkeys. So onward they go. They enter the city and ask around for the prophet. Samuel's low profile is striking. Here is a man who doesn't value status, pomp and circumstance. Neither Saul nor his servant seems to even know Samuel's name. They keep calling him the prophet or the seer. And Samuel has no entourage, no bodyguard, no special clothing. In fact, Saul ends up walking up to Samuel in the street and going, excuse me, where's the house of the prophet? <laughs> Samuel immediately knew that this was the man the Lord had chosen to be king and save God's people from the Philistines. And he gives Saul this enigmatic answer. Samuel answers Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place to make sacrifice, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my family the humblest of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me this way? Saul is nervous. He's intrigued. He's a little bit freaked out. Samuel has hinted that greatness awaits him and his family. He wants to stick around and find out what the prophet means. Does he know that Samuel is looking for a king? You'd think he probably ought to, but he doesn't seem to. Samuel takes Saul up to the day's sacrifice. He puts him at the head of the table and gives him the choicest foods. And the next morning, Samuel walks Saul just outside of town. Then, privately, Samuel anoints Saul and gives him a very bizarre set of instructions. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies round about. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on from there further and come to the Oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. 
After that, you shall come to Gibeas Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as you come to the city, you will meet a band of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you, and you shall prophesy with them, and you've turned into another man. Now, when these signs meet you, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. And all the signs came to pass that day, one right after the other. God gave, God gave Saul a new heart. God gave Saul all these signs, all these experiences. And then Saul arrived home and was greeted by his uncle. Where have you been? <coughs> oh, we went to look for the donkeys. And when we couldn't find them, we uh, went to the prophet Samuel. Please, tell me what Samuel said to you. He said the donkeys had been found. <laughs> End of story. Here we see the first sign that something may not be quite right. Why does God give signs? Need our attention. Because people need them. Yeah. To get attention. Our attention. I like that. To get attention. Because we ask for them. Because we ask for them. Yeah. He answers our prayers. Devil puts them out, but he's that's, that's a good. That's a good point. Um, sometimes signs are just signs of love. I mean, hey, look, found lost object. God must love me. <laughs> but sometimes I think you're referring to you know when we're looking for guidance. God, what do you want me to do? Send right. me a sign. That is the sign. Yeah. Sometimes he. Sometimes he's going to send us a sign. Sometimes he won't. God's not beholden to us. We can't. You know. Okay. Where's that sign? Come on. <laughs> you're late. <laughs> And God does not, God's not a puppeteer. God does give us free will. God doesn't want to control every minuscule aspect of our lives. He wants to guide us. He also wants to leave space for us to act. So how in the world does this work in everyday life? Well, we can ask for signs. We'll see if God gives them to us. If he does, we recognize them, we follow them. If he doesn't, we pray about it. We follow the peace. We do what seems right. We do what is according to common morality, according to church teaching, according to our conscience, according also to, uh, I really do like to go with what gives peace. It's something that's totally morally neutral. God, what's the best decision here? I'll listen for the peace. That's what, that's what St. Ignatius of Loyola used to do. And uh, I like that idea. Yeah. God wants us to overcome our insecurity. God gives us signs to give us confidence in him, confidence that he is leading us. We don't have to be the ones in control. God's in control. God wants to guide us. God wants to give us direction. God wants to guide us out of our comfort zone. God gives us signs also to show that he really cares for us, sometimes even in the, the littlest detail of our lives. God wants to give us signs to show that we don't have to worry. He's got it. He's in control. God wants to give us signs to show that he loves us. Signs from God are love letters. They are mysterious. They are enticing. God uses them to woo us. And Saul had not only signs. Saul had an incredibly powerful, ecstatic experience. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he prophesied and was given the assurance that God was with him. This should have been an incredible experience of the direct intimacy with God. But Saul seems strangely impervious to being wooed by God. It reminds me of the beginning of my own conversion the beginning of my own conversion to the Catholic Church, my own deeper conversion to following God, I too ignored signs from God. I didn't trust my own experience. I didn't trust that God was really acting in my life. The major moment that comes to mind is after my first encounter with a saint, Saint Dominic, and the encounter with his relics in Bologna, Italy. In 2003, I walked out of the church 
and I looked at the students zipping by on their Vespas on that cold day, and I went, that's reality. This is real life, right here in front of me. That, that's my crazy imagination. And I walked on my merry way, and if God hadn't sent more signs and done more crazy things with my life, I would never have given it all a second thought. I think that's where Saul is right now. Saul does not trust what he has experienced, despite these incredibly detailed signs, despite a rapturous spiritual experience. Saul won't talk about it. For the time being, he's pretending like it never happened. It's on the back burner. When you give someone a special gift and they toss it aside, how do you feel? <laughs> now, God's not discouraged. God's going to try again. God's not going to give up. He didn't give up on me. He's not giving up on any one of us. But when we ignore signs from God or take them lightly, it hurts. It shows a relationship that's cold. One where we're not as open to him as he would like us to be. One where we're afraid to let go and trust him. When we keep our eyes open to God's presence in our lives and celebrate it and commemorate it and remember it and talk about it, we take joy in the Lord. When we see and remember and talk about these things, it helps us to recall everything God's done for us ever more clearly. And we begin to be overwhelmed by gratitude for all the goodness God has poured into our lives and that he continues to pour into our lives each and every day. We take joy in the Lord, and God responds. God takes great joy in us. And this mutual joy in one another, that's an incredible pull towards union with God. One example for us as Catholics, when we receive the Eucharist, we are united to Jesus Christ. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Do you ever stop to wonder, what's he doing in there? <laughs> what is he doing to my soul, to your soul? How is he acting in us? Do we receive him with awe and anticipation and a little bit of, what's he going to do this time? Do we wonder, how is he going to change me now? Or are we strangely impervious to being wooed by God? Are we forgetful? Are we cold? When God speaks to people in the book of 1 Samuel here, how do they respond? Saul is most often cold, as we're going to see. He's closed off. He believes in God. He recognizes God's presence in the prophets and in the priests. But he does not seem to recognize God's presence at work in his very own life. He stays distant. He doesn't see how God is trying to connect with him. Samuel. How does Samuel respond to God? Samuel is inspired to extraordinary obedience in the face of difficult trials. Looking ahead a little here, how does Jonathan respond to God? Jonathan is inspired to extraordinary bravery and selflessness. Jumping a little further ahead, how does David respond to God? David is simply delighted. David sings. David dances. David takes joy in the Lord. David writes things like, My soul is feasted as with marrow and fat. And my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. David takes great delight in God. I'm sure I'm going to come back to this because that is his number one key feature. David takes great delight in God. And God takes great delight in David. It is no wonder God calls David a man after my own heart. David was a man who constantly sought to love and be loved by God. How about us? 
do we recognize God's presence in our lives? And how do we respond? We know that God's presence is everywhere. We don't necessarily need to wait for a band of singing prophets to come along to recognize it. A sunset will do. Do we take the time to see God at work all around us? To experience the wonder of his love for us and all the little gifts he gives us in everyday life. To linger there. To be transformed. <laughs>